So I just want to uh, give a very brief intro that wouldn't do you justice, but I think a couple of awesome work that you have done. Uh, you wrote this book, The Year of uh, Blue Water, I think in 2019. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, right. And then you're currently working on a second book, um, which is publishing next year? Yes. Yeah. Me too. Wow. Okay. So, and, and I think I'm so excited for that one. Um, in addition to that, you, your work, uh, Yang's work has been featured in NPR, like many, well, many different awards. And he also writes a monthly column called the reading, uh, reading.yangyi.com. And within that, there's the writing, which you give very detailed writing advice uh, to, to readers. And also on this call as well, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, I had to start with this question because I think anyone who have read your work will wonder this. How, how do you manage to invite readers into your piece as if everything you wrote is like talking to someone else. It's like maybe you are in their living room, you know how they're thinking, you really understand their fear, their concerns, their dreams. Like how are you able to do that? I think one of the most important parts of, I guess, relating to another person is um, really knowing yourself and expressing yourself in a genuine way. Um, I mean, a lot of the times when I'm writing letters or even when I was writing my first book, I was really trying to, how would I say this if I was just saying it to myself so that I can understand it? And that's the way that I think about basically almost all of the writing that I do. Um, I mean, some of the poetry I write is kind of a, a little more um, abstract, if you will. But um, when I was in, when I was working in tech, I used to give like tech presentations and stuff. And even kind of remembering my experience of speaking publicly like that, a lot of it was like, how do I make this very specific knowledge that I know because I've, I've been working on it for six months, like um, easy to understand for someone who doesn't have the same context. So there's that part. And then there's the, you can think about that in terms of like, so how do I express myself and represent myself in a way that someone else might understand um, if, you know, they had just met me. Yeah. So that's and, one of the things that I think about. Right. And I think that context is very helpful. I think I, I heard somewhere you said you spent eight hours replying to an, a, a question every week or every every month, right? What do you do in mm -hmm. that eight hours? Like, I, assuming there is some rewrite uh, and, and some research, but we just <laughs> We'll also know, like, what's the creativity practice at play? Well, you know, the thing that's kind of funny is that um, if, if I were to, you know, sit down and so if someone were to ask me to, like, write 1,200 words, I would absolutely be able to um, within, like, an hour, if not less than that. Um, but the, for me, it's a lot more about when I'm, when I'm writing those letters, it's a lot more about the quality of like the time that you're spending with me. Like if you're going to read a 1200 word thing, it better be good. Like I get a daily poem every day from one of them. Like I get many actually daily poems. And whenever there's a long poem, I love poetry. I'm always like, it's too early. Like it's 6 a.m. I don't know. I can't. I, I don't want to do the whole thing. I do eventually read them sometimes, um, but uh, so that was kind of circuitous, but like I, I could write something really quickly, but um, what actually ends up happening is that I read the letter over and over again, and the process kind of changes depending on what I'm thinking about, but I'll usually pick a letter a couple of days before um, I actually start answering it because um, you have to kind of like prepare to write. Um, I will meditate on it. I will just like let it enter my thinking ecosystem. And so what happens is that I'll start to notice when I'm experiencing something that might be related to how I might want to answer that question. Um, and so I give myself a couple of days. And then I will um, first do kind of a rough draft where basically I like blurt out every single thing that comes to mind. And I'm I'm someone who has a lot of ideas. So it can kind of be like um, letting all these ideas come out of like a tiny crack in a dam basically when I'm first writing these drafts. And a lot of the time 
what I end up writing in my notebook doesn't actually end up in the letter. Um, it's just like a way for me to get all of my thoughts through until I get to the actually like good thought or the, the thing that is like the thing that that person can take away. Um, and so that that is part of the process. Um, sometimes when I'm stuck, I do transcribe what I've written in my notebook to kind of jumpstart myself again into like, what was I thinking about? Like, what were the ideas? And that's also helpful too. Um, and then usually I'll like either finish writing the letter or I'll, um, I, sometimes if I'm stuck, I'll just walk away from it for a little while and like give myself a couple of hours and then I come back. But if you're a writer, it's important to know when to wait, when to actually write and when to stop. And, um, so that's kind of what I've, what I've been working on perfecting, I guess, with these letters, I had an opportunity to, cause I was writing them every week. Um, but yeah, that's been something that I've, it's, it's different for every thing that you write. So I wouldn't do the same thing if I were working on a poem, for example. And, and how do you know when you stop, when you stop? Cause I think I may have read it somewhere where you say, you, when you feel it's almost perfect, you will stop, right? Or like that may be mm -hmm. a change over time, but curious how you are currently fine tuning that process. Um, it's interesting. I so when I was a software engineer, I would work on solving technology problems, and there's this thing called bugs, right? It's like something's glitching in the software, and I remember um, uh, a lot of the advice that I remember seeing was like, if you have been hammering away at a bug for over an hour and you still haven't gotten every anywhere, it's time to walk away, and it's kind of a similar feeling, right? Of of fatigue. And like your brain has gone to outer space, basically like mashed into that brick wall of whatever you're doing. And I think it's really important to recognize when you have splayed out everything, all the cards that you have, and none of them are coming up with answers for you and to walk away when that's the case, um, because you never know what you're going to see on that walk. Many dogs, if you're in a place where there are dogs. Or um, if it's the springtime, you can walk through the park and actually look at the flowers that are starting to bloom. And one of my favorite things to do is look at the tiny leaves that are coming out of trees. They're like little baby leaves. It's really, it's really beautiful. And then you, you just stop thinking about that thing. And then when you come back, you'll be like, oh, I guess I could have just done that. What if I just did that? So yeah, that's, that's my current go-to method. <laughs> A lot of your writing is, as you said, you look at the question a few days before you just live and incorporate those experiences into the writing piece. And mm -hmm. the, the other question I want to ask is, who is your audience? Is it, are you writing for yourself, for the person who asked the question, for both maybe, or for mm -hmm. your community uh, on, at a whole? Um, I think that it's kind of all of the above a little bit. Like, I'm definitely writing for myself because when you're writing, you you have to understand what you're writing. Like, if you don't understand what you're saying, then <laughs> someone's gonna ask you a question one day in an interview and you're gonna be like, I don't know, like I just wrote it. <laughs> so, um, and I think that's especially important in poetry because a lot of the time you can write a poem that makes perfect sense to you, but like someone's gonna ask you one day, like, why did you include a semicolon instead of a colon? And you better be able to answer that. Like you have to have that kind of attention to your own work. So you, like I'm the audience. And then there's, um, I think definitely a younger me who's the audience too. Like my 20 year old self who was like, I don't know how to like be a writer. I don't think I'm a writer. I clearly did not major. I'm not majoring in writing. Like, I'm not that person and I don't feel permission to be that person. And I think a lot of the ethos of what I'm trying to do with the reading in particular is to um, give kind of a, an expression to the permission that everyone deserves in um, taking part in your own care and taking part in the dreams that you have in your own life, not just the job you're supposed to have, um, the, I don't know, family you're supposed to have, the children you're supposed to have, the gender you're supposed to have, like those are, um, those are all things that like we're, we're just told, especially if you have a K through 12 education, um, 
what you're supposed to be doing, there's always something to do next. And um, I really want people to answer or the question of like, what would you do if there was nothing to do next? Who would you be? Um, and writing and art are just one of the great ways for me to contemplate that um, and to actually that pursue question. them. Yeah, that question, what would you do if there's nothing to do next? It's so part, it's such a powerful prompt. And uh, I think a lot of your writing as an artist has to do with constraint, especially in poetry, right? So Nanya, I'll hand it over to you uh, to think more into that aspect. Love the tag team. Um, I have so many questions, uh, so many things that um, that you're, what you've already said makes me reflect on. Um, so I write poetry and um, I mean, what you're saying about first, you have to know yourself and what you want to say. Uh, sometimes it comes while you're writing, but definitely there is a reason for the semicolon and not a comma or something else. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it's it's very powerful to know um, in the moment, but then also after, during the editing, uh, why you, you included that. So I guess my question is, um, it's a simple one. Um, mm -hmm. It's how, how does it poetry shape your writing? Um, so your attention to maybe harnessing very intense experiences in a very short amount of space, um, because nobody else wants to read long poetry at 6 a.m. Um, how does that translate to uh, your vivid writing uh, when you're writing longer newsletters? Um, I think the number one thing is that um, it's all really about attention. And if you're a writer, um, and if I think especially with poetry, poetry for can be so many things, but one of the things that I do love about poetry is that it is a kind of writing where the observation or the looking is the point, the feeling of the perceiving of is the point, um, that it's an art form in language, which is something that we don't have to go to a museum to look at, to experience. Um, and so there's that attention to language and, but also that attention that I think translates to life. That is um, really what, I mean, art has freed me in many, many ways. And um, it's kind of translating that experience for other people that, in, that is the way that poetry informs those letters. Um, it's all a practice of attention, whether at a micro or macro level. And um, sometimes that attention is about looking at another person and the things that they have written to me and trying my best to understand where they might be coming from. Um, I mean, it's the attention of a good friend, right? Someone who really knows you and who has, you know, spent time with you. And I don't get to have that kind of relationship with the people who write to me. But uh, I really do try my best to um, give them the closest approximate. That's beautiful. Um, so it's kind of like interpreting your own self to others, but then also trying to understand where they're coming from um, yeah. in a way so that you can respond to them with what makes maybe best sense for the two of you in that equation. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and how much, I guess, attention do you, where are the words? Uh, how much attention do you pay to, uh, I guess, your feelings of things versus your observations of things? Hmm. In, in what context, just in general or? Um, in writing, but then also in the living that leads to the writing. I mean, I th uh, so recently I read, um, Joan Didion's The White Album. And um, I don't know how many of you have actually read Joan Didion. It took me a long time, clearly, to, to read her myself. But um, she's really known for having kind of a sparse prose style that is also very observational. She writes about details and she's really good at just picking up like, here's the thing that I'm writing about. And, um, you know, let me talk about a couple of things in, in extreme detail about those. 
but it's interesting to me because she also is a, is able to evoke emotion in her writing um, while she's doing it. And there's something about her tone or her style that allows her to do that. So um, I, I mean, like, it's hard for me to, to differentiate the two really, because I think that when I'm observing something, I'm feeling it, you know, like, I don't really think that emotionally speak like it's like when you watch a movie and there's like certain music there and you know like I really don't like horror movies for example and I'm I know that when they play that dun 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 whatever that music is I'm like oh no like something terrible is going to happen and I hide under whatever is in front of me um and that's also a perception or something that I'm noticing or feeling um my partner is currently um, so I moved from New York and my partner is right now is in New York at the moment, New York City um, on a vacation. And they have been telling me that like, they like have been experiencing like, oh, the city is suddenly, I just feel like um, now that we've been gone for over a year, like the city is really intense to experience. And that's been creating feelings of anxiety actually. Um, and uh, there's this essay by this guy named George Simmel, I think, and he's where he's basically talking about in order to survive in a city, it's so um, perceptually intense that you have to create, create a kind of dissociative barrier in order to be able to walk through the street while getting catcalled or being told to go back to where you came from. So um, yeah, there's, I, I, it's not, it's like the same to me. I feel you. Um, every time I go to a new place or even go back to the same place, especially if it's somewhere like New York City um, or my home, India, um, as you can imagine, things are pretty intense. And yeah. um, that barrier, uh, I guess it kind of acts as a filter, right, as well uh, mm -hmm. to what you take in and then how what you then further allow to percolate um, yeah. and then turn that into art. and. On the other hand, the intensity can be quite nice as well because it's a lot of food for, for thought, for writing, for um, that kind of experiential essay or poetry. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's really cool. Um, I think Yen, uh, I think Charlene has a question for you uh, about editing, and I kind mm -hmm. of want to segue into that. Um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So I think, I mean, you are a poet, but also a critic, right? So I think you have read so many works, either uh, poetry or prose, uh, poems, or, or even just prose. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm just curious, how do you apply those ad ad editorial lenses to your own, own work? And what are some of those mm -hmm. tools that we as writers could apply in our own craft as well? an interesting question because um I do I think I have noticed that there there is kind of a difference in the ways that the kinds of space I give myself in um writing poetry and writing prose but they're both still very creative like endeavors no matter what which one I'm doing um the I think for me tonally the audience shifts a little bit in terms of like um, how I write or what I edit, um, for either poetry or prose, but, um, I guess I can talk about prose first because that's a little more straightforward, but, um, I'm still kind of experimenting with how I edit myself, um, prose wise. I really like doing a lot of like feeling around and researching and kind of going down rabbit holes. I'm a very, I mean, I think this is why I'm a poet. I'm a very kind of like multivalent thinker. So when I write an outline, I start, I usually start like eight different threads of like what I can talk about or how this relates to that or whatever. And it can be really difficult to write an essay that um, has all of those things kind of comprehensively threaded with each other. So writing, um, like writing the reading, for example, those letters, um, I... I end up actually having a lot to say um, as I was talking about with my process. And then I just, I kind of really try to distill it because I know I'm like, my goal is to, 
to do only do like 1200 words don't let you sometimes i go up to 17 i've gone i've gotten high but um i really try to distill it to like what is the one thing that i want you to be able to take away from this because um just to use the metaphor of the city again like you have to filter out stuff right and so we're only going to keep the things that we really that are really new or kind of insightful in a way that helps us in some way in our lives um, or that brings us a new kind of bit of information um, and i don't mean that in a kind of like um capitalistic way but i mean of like what can really be useful is something that i'm interested in um not just interesting um and that's kind of how i do the distillation process and then there's the whole kind of like actually structuring um, I, I have a friend who reverse outlines. So after you write the thing that you wrote, you read through it again. And then what, like, what's the main point of this paragraph? Can it be distilled into a different way? Yada, yada. And then you look at like the whole argument and see like, is it, you know, is this, um, straightforward basically. And it kind of helps you see the, like forest for the trees. Yeah in forest instead of the trees or whatever. Um, with poetry, it's like, I mean, I could I could have a whole kind of conversation about poetry, but um, if you want, I can talk about it, but I, I can yeah. also stop it. We'll, we'll love to hear about poetry as well. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> um, so poetry is, a, is like that process, but like way more languorous. Um, it's like geographic or <laughs> uh, geological time. Um, I really like to, um, I don't really force myself to write poetry. Um, I get to a place where I really crave it spiritually. And so I'm reading a lot of poetry and I kind of just let it happen if it happens. Um, I, I do journal. Um, I keep like a pretty, like a semi-regular journal now. And, um, in the past when I was writing the year of blue water and also, um, when I was writing Dream of the Divided Field, um, a lot of the poems that ended up in my second book, for example, actually started out, like I wanna say like half of those poems started out as, as I was just writing a journal entry and then I was thinking about something and I just, I kind of just think in metaphors. So what would be me trying to describe something to myself to you know figure it out would actually end up being like a poem. And that's actually um, one of the poems that, um, I, I wrote for the book that's like a two two pager or something, which is very long for me, um, came out of that process. So um, the editing aspect is just really being open to um, the, the poem happening at any time and not discounting any of your writing and not underestimating any of your writing. And, um, you know, after six months, you may discover that that journal entry that you wrote was um saying something really important that you are like oh like i wish that was a poem and then you can just make it a poem do you often go back to re read your journal or it's sort of like the connections where it just happened intuitively and then you go back and find where it first happened i don't really read my journals in a like scheduled way it's more of like if i get to a point where there's it's usually like some intuition of just like kind of time to like go read the journals. My journals are very boring. Most journals are very boring. And um, <laughs> sometimes you just reach a saturation point and you're just like, I don't really want to read these anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, sometimes they are very interesting. I mean, I have it, I had, you know, I've, I have a pandemic journal, right? So like, who knows whatever, I mean, there's a long silence. <laughs> during that obviously I didn't I was not in the mind space to be putting anything on paper but um you never know so um I have like a couple of journals that I haven't read that I've been writing in in the past year or two and just letting them I'm just letting it's it's really like a fine wine just let them kind of like yeah clear you know become clearer and clearer over time yeah and uh you you wrote that piece around your relationship with reading and I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, when you used to visit Mads very often before the pandemic, but now probably like reading books a lot more. I'm curious, like, who do you pick to read, like doing the, those deep dives? And 
how do you break down the structure and extract or analyze some unique elements for your own creativity process? Um, I don't know if I ever really like break it down per se. I feel like, like I have some people who I read to get back into it, but I've actually honestly, like, I think that I've had them for too long, honestly. And now I'm kind of like, I actually tried reading them a couple weeks ago and I was like, I'm a little bored. I want something different. I've reread these books too much. So um, Joan Didion was the first um, book that I read that I was like, oh, I can definitely read. I can still read. <laughs> um, I finished that book in like two days or something. So it was, that was exhilarating. And I think that I'm, I'm a, like, I, when I was, I don't know, seven, like I loved reading books. I still love reading. It's the same like childish kind of desire for wonder. And um, you can't get wonder by rereading things um, necessarily. You obviously could, um, but sometimes you need a couple more years of growing and changing to get new observations. And um, so in that, those moments, it's always good to try and find new writing. Um, but yeah, I don't really, I don't really do a, the whole breaking, uh, breaking things down. I do a lot of kind of like listening to the music of whatever the poetry it is that I'm reading, and then um, thinking about the things that they're saying. Like sometimes when you're heartbroken, you just like reading books of poems that are about heartbreak, you know. And um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot like that more for me. So just like. like it's more of that experiential where you actually sit with what the author is trying to write and listen to what they were trying to say, right? And then maybe mm -hmm. get that insp inspiration and infuse that into your work. I love it. Yeah, and sometimes I don't, it, you don't even get that influence until years later um, when you're just like, oh, I know, I know, I know a writer who does that really well because I read them five years ago. And like now that I've read the white album i'm like oh i guess i can read the other ones i did love the um netflix document netflix documentary the center will not hold on on joan dinian um but i watched that years ago yeah <laughs> i was well, like i, I should read her writing it. now <laughs> <laughs> didn't happen yeah. yeah i mean I, I bet that resonates with a bunch of people uh seeing that in the chat and another very common question people ask in, in online writing is about audience. And I think you have a very unique take on what, what is building an audience mean, what's about presence. And mm -hmm. Nadia, would you like to uh, jump into that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so one thing that we both really like about your newsletter and your writing in general is that you're very authentic, you're very present. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't like the word authentic. <laughs> I like, I, no, but- um, What does it mean? <laughs> exactly. No, but you're very much yourself, but I feel that you're very quietly listening as well to the world around you uh, and to other people's feelings. Um, I love that you make space for um, for any reader, not, not just the person who wrote to you and not just uh, me, for example, but like anybody mm -hmm. else in the world to come in and experience um, a bit of you, a bit of what you're thinking about, um, and you kind of invite them to maybe make that one part of uh, their sort of cumulative thinking on that. Um, mm. So I guess how do you for yourself um, come to that point? How do you, the question here is how do you cultivate your presence through your books, letters, and poetry? Mm -hmm. um, but how, how do you make space for yourself really uh, to be who you are and also for um, the reader uh, to come and experience a bit of that with you and then go ahead from there? Yeah, did I, I'm- did I, Yeah, did I get that? Sorry. I think so. I mean, thank you. I'm so glad that you feel connected in to the work in that way. And it's absolutely what I want. Um, you're like the way to kind of get to that level of um, authenticity for the lack of a better word right now. Um, 
is kind of what I was started out talking about, which is attention to yourself, which I'm not great at, by the way. Like I grew up in a codependent household, just like all the other immigrant, like firstborns. And I, um, it's something that I'm still practicing. And in an ideal world, intellectually, I know, but you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, that like, in, I know that the best thing that you can do for creating an authentic presence um, in the world is by actually having that presence. It's about like having spent the day, like taking care of yourself, like going to the spa, getting really great food, whatever is the thing that like you do for yourself that really energizes you and gives you life. That is the way that you will have space for another person and to genuinely be ready and able to give generously and not give in a way that's like about giving so that you can get something from that other person, if that makes sense. Um, which I think that like, I mean, newsletters are such a huge thing now. And I think everyone's like, oh my gosh, should I start one and start making $175,000 a year or <laughs> whatever? You won't make that much, I promise. Um, but like, I do think that there's a kind of like, oh, I have to make a product now. And, um, you know, I go back and forth on whether or not I should keep writing the reading or if I should stop. And it's something I kind of constantly check in with myself on because um, it's very important to me that I have the energy to give the type of attention that um, makes the reading as special as it is and makes it genuine in that way that you can feel. Um, as I, and I think I'm going to keep saying this forever, but my, my friend who is a medievalist and also a professor, um, she gave me some teaching advice last summer that was, um, all you have to do for students is to give them attention because your only job is to give students attention because attention is love. And so, um, if I can, um, muster the energy to take care of myself and to, you know, recharge my batteries, then I have the capacity to actually give that love in a genuine way. And that comes out as attention, which I've honed through, you know, other things that I write. So yeah, that is, that is the main advice I would uh, give people. Have a spa day. That makes so much sense. Uh, I'm sure so many of us uh, have those stories or narratives for ourselves also where we grew up not necessarily knowing that we had to put in just give us give ourselves some time and um i don't know i feel like in my circle or in my bubble everybody is a bit more aware of that and a bit more um taking a pause uh, in the face of social media or creating or working or all of those things and i and i think it's a really powerful thing um I do feel I do feel like the newsletter is a gift, um, as is everything else that I've seen of you. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Charlene, do you have any other questions for the moment? I have a very curious question. So I think in the in your almost like last page of the book, um, mm -hmm. you've mentioned that there's a question you're constantly trying to answer or mm -hmm. seeking to answer, which is why is art necessary? And I think that question, when I first read it, I I have a lot to say, but I couldn't find a word to express mm -hmm. it. So I'm curious to know what's your current way of exploring that question? Um, I would say, so the, um, so the question is, uh, why is art necessary? And in the in that particular poem, I'm kind of talking about how um, it's impossible to answer, and that's kind of the point. Um, because I think for me at the moment, I'm really in this space of the the question, like the the fa making it so that the um, so that you're following a question, and you're trying to constantly answer it is actually the 
energy that creates your life. It's the process that creates your, uh, your life and the things that you actually want. And the point is that, that you're always proving um, in a way that the art is necessary because for me, the art is you. And the art is kind of the nexus of what I want. And it's the closest thing that I have to instant gratification. Um, well, which some people would argue, <laughs> obviously, uh, over because, you know, writing is hard as well in its own ways. But um, yeah, that I mean, it's so interesting because I wrote that book at this point, like, um, four years ago or something like that, four or five years ago. Wow. And it's, I know, right? Because it came out in 2019, but you know, you, you work on the book, everything kind of happens in like delayed time with everyone else of like, I was thinking about that at a different moment when you're thinking about it. So it's been actually really cool to kind of watch my own way of thinking about my own book change since I finished writing it. Um, and that also happens, your relationship with your own writing changes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's even happening. I reread my second book this morning. I reread the manuscript and um, I already have a different relationship to it because I wrote it in 2018. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, I have, I have a question. How do you, and how do you like, how do you deal with that? Um, I had the same experience with my book. I wrote it over a period mm -hmm. of 10 years, I guess. And it was more like round and writings. And then it kind of all came together. And since mm -hmm. it became a manuscript and since it was published and since people are asking me about, oh, but like, I love this piece about that. And I was like, yeah, but it's so different how I feel about it now. So how do you, um, what do you remind yourself uh, to, I guess, remember that maybe you were different, different uh, in a different phase with your relationship to something at that mm -hmm. point? It's really, yeah, it's really interesting to see a different reflection of yourself, to notice, um, to notice your own face changing. You know, it's like a, t it's like a, you're the, you see the future version of the time lapse, but other people don't only see the, the younger, the younger version. Um, I, I really think that like that, that whole process is about kind of, um, part of it is it's about the other person at that point, you know, it's like, it's about them kind of getting to that thought because of you, because of what you wrote then. And in a way they're meeting, you know, 2015 you and, um, that's who they're connecting to in a way, depending on, you know, who is the speaker, blah, blah, blah. But um, I think that's also very powerful. And, and part of, um, I guess, my response when people talk to me about, for example, the year of blue water is that like, um, I get to kind of receive them in this moment when they have found something in that work that I made. And then I get to talk about it with them. And if my feelings have changed, which there are several, like there are things in that book that I would probably write differently now than I, like, you know, would have then. Um, but I just didn't know. And there's still more that I don't know because I'm still changing. And um, that's also exciting. So I don't know. We're always changing is my answer. So I never know myself. Absolutely. Um, we have a question from Rin. Would you like to, would you like to say your question out in your own voice? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yan Yi, and thank you, Charlene and Nanya. Um, I wanted to ask about sort of um, navigating the tension between um, wanting to have a a presence and a generous presence uh, to your readers and then kind of the self-care that you were talking about and like how do you navigate that when you have a schedule like for your newsletter I know that you shifted the reading to a monthly mm -hmm. schedule from a weekly um, I was wondering if you want to talk about that that process a little bit and kind of what led to that thank you yeah totally um so I started the reading in July 2020 which was a year ago um 
this weekend, I guess this weekend would be my, my next, my third letter, whatever anniversary. Um, the, so there are a couple of things that I do. First of all, obviously, as you've noticed, I change my schedule. Um, if you know, I like your newsletter is your, it, like if you set a schedule for yourself and you don't want to meet that schedule anymore, you are absolutely free to change it. And um, I think there's a level of like, we're so used to like, oh, accountability buddy. So like, if I say to other people, I'm going to do it, then I have to do it. But the reality is that it's your newsletter. It's your business. It's your, it's your business and it's your business. So you can change it whenever you want. And it's important to kind of like, remember that you're in control of your own life and you're not giving it away to other people. Um, you can change your mind and other people will understand most of the time. And in a way you'll be inspiring them to have the courage to do the same thing for their own lives. If there's something in there where they're like, oh, I don't wanna, well, I said I would. And you know, that's the excuse, right? For the inertia. Um, so that, that's one thing that's kind of, you know, more straightforward. The second thing is that um, uh, it's very useful that I respond to reader letters um, because I always have something to respond to, right? I'm not just sitting there being like, okay, like, what do I need to write about this week? Like, what's the thing? So it's a lot more of like, someone's already asked a question. So all I have to do is answer it. And I'm a gabber. So like, that, of course I'll like, you know, take the excuse to talk. Um, but, uh, the reason why, so I was going weekly for, um, basically, uh, nine months or something like that. And it was exhausting, <laughs> especially when after the summer I started teaching as well. Um, twice a week I was teaching an intro to creative writing class and I was, um, still finishing my MFA, my graduate degree. So I was a little busy. And I was doing events and, you know, all the regular stuff that I usually do. So um, it got to be too much, obviously. I could do it, can, can do it, which, you know, is most of the, like, you know, I think it's something that's the threshold usually that we give ourselves, right? Like if you can do it, then you'll do it, right? But if you make that the threshold, it ends up being the, uh, you know, you'll cross that threshold and then you'll burn out and then you'll like, you know, cancel plans with everyone and quit your job and like <laughs> have some sort of quarter life or midlife crisis. Um, so I took a break in December of 2020 and kind of allowed myself a couple of weeks to recoup. And that was a really important period of time for me. So now I actually recommend people to do regular self check-ins for their, you know, external writing, if you're doing any type of regular writing and really ask yourself, do you want to be doing this at the rate that you're doing it? And, you know, what ideally would you actually be doing? Um, and if I hadn't taken that vacation, I don't know if I would have realized it because I'm still, as I said earlier, working on that stuff. So um, the fact that I was just feeling dread going back to the weekly schedule meant that I had to change something. Um, so I have gotten better in the sense that I actually do listen to my feelings now, which before I was like, feelings, I'm not sure about those things. Um, so that would, those are kind of my three things that I would say, change the schedule, um, set it up so that you can be responding to something, have a structure for yourself. And then the last thing is actually check in with yourself regularly to, to make those changes. Um, oh, and how has the transition been for me? Great. Um, it was definitely the right decision. I still think about, well, maybe I can just like write more letters. Like maybe I can like up my subscriber, just subscriber numbers a little more if I work harder. And it's like, but that's not actually what I want to do. And I have to like tell myself that constantly because numbers are so attractive to me. Like, I'm like, oh, I just want to make it go up, you know, but like, what is it actually that you want in your life? So it doesn't have to be that one thing that is that has a number attached to it. And if you like numbers that much, I would recommend adding some sort of numerical tracker for the thing that you actually want to do, which is what I'm doing. I actually, I, uh, I downloaded a spreadsheet that allows you to track the 
number of words that you write every day, which is useful only for prose writers. I mean, cause like, I don't really care how long my poems are. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Very, very good life hack. Uh, Lau has a question, um, mm -hmm. uh, writing advice column. Um, so his question is, how do you go about getting letters from readers? I think you have a submit or a replying to the writing uh, like inbox. And the other mm -hmm. question is, were people always asking you questions? And is that why you started writing your responses publicly? Um, so how do I go about getting letters from readers? I just have a Google form that I set up and I really was not, I was like, no one's going to write, no one's going to write me. <laughs> I was like, not like, this is just this thing that I'm starting. Like my partner offered to write me fake letters for as long as there were no, no, no one in the letterbox, but it turns out that people did write me. And at first it was, you know, a couple of letters every so often. And then, you know, it got to a point where I had a backlog. So right now I get a new letter because I'm only writing it monthly. I get a new letter maybe every other month or so, but I have like a little bit of a backlog. So it's okay. I might do like, Hey, write me a letter at some point. Um, but that's, that's kind of, it. I just asked people to write to me and then they did. So it was, it was quick. Um, I was very surprised. Um, I think it does help though, that I had a, I, I already had a social media following from my existing career. So I, I had a couple thousand people following me on Twitter and Instagram and I posted there. And that was, I think also part of the, obviously one of the reasons why, and, um, because I've been doing the poetry thing for a while. Um, how, Okay, were people always asking you questions and that's why you started writing your responses publicly. So um, I remember it as people always asking me questions, but it could just be unsolicited advice, right? <laughs> um, I was really uh, um, raised to be a caretaker in all ways, good and bad. And so I feel like part of why the reading, well, part of the reason why I started the reading is because I have a lot of unchanneled like mom feeling or dad like like I don't know um tendencies so it's been really good to just have a space where I'm like okay I'm gonna like give advice here versus like whenever someone's like oh can you give me advice it's like there goes three hours of my time so um the short answer is yes. Um, people were asking me questions, but also yes. Sometimes I was the one who asked the questions and I just answered it for them. <laughs> um, but it was an idea that I had after, you know, talking to several people and noticing like, they were like, oh, I can't write. And then I was like, but why can't you write? And they're like, cause I'm not writing. And I'm like, but why can't you write? So that, that just turned into kind of like, oh, I should probably like start a podcast because <laughs> it was podcast, you know, when the era when everyone was supposed to start a podcast, but now it's the era when everyone's supposed to start a newsletter. So. Uh, I wanted to ask if anybody else has a question, otherwise we can start to wrap up. Seeing no takers, I have a question. Um, you mentioned uh, that your newsletter, oh wait, no, writing your newsletter was, oh no, I've lost the quote, is what you would do if you had nothing to do next, right? So I guess my question to you is what's next, either in terms of mm -hmm. your newsletter or in other projects? Good question. Um, I always have a million projects going on. Um, I think what's most difficult for me is like really focusing on them and sticking to them, um, you know, neurodivergence, et cetera. So um, I have, I have a couple of different projects. I'm working on a book based on the reading. It's a um, book about figuring out how to be a writer. Um, prosy book. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the tone I wrote 20,000 words and then I wrote another like 5,000 words in different tones. And I'm just like, if they're not right. So I don't know, that's, that's the thing. Um, and then 
I'm also working on a poetry project. Um, it's an erasure project slash kind of a documentary po poet poetic uh, documentary poetry project. Um, I'm really interested in looking at um, abuse at all levels of formation in with with a with people um, and looking at primary documents, but also um, talking about abuse in a queer relationship that I had and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of next on the docket. And, and I'm trying to like find teaching jobs and like be a person surviving in capitalist America. Like that's, I'm, I'm doing the, the hustle dance or whatever. Um, so yeah, and I'm also, um, I, um, I'm mentoring someone right now, which is really nice. And I might start offering that more publicly. I was just doing a pilot program, but it turns out I'm good at mentoring, um, if I may say so myself, because I like it. So I'll, I'll just, it turns out I like mentoring. So um, yeah, so that's, those are kind of the things on the docket, but there's always a million other things going on at the same time. So. I feel like the advice column is mentoring at large. It is actually absolutely true. That was actually kind of a point because it's like, why do you have to like be in a hundred thousand dollar like per year MFA program to get this advice? I mean, you did the MFA, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was um, that's I mean that's a whole conversation we can have, but yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're so so grateful for you to come and join us. Share a lot of advice and the questions we have around writing finding your uh finding your community cultivating your presence and all that so thank you so much and we we had so much fun and we'll share this uh out in a week or so if you want if people want to follow you and check out your work what would be the best way to do so uh you can go to my website you need.com um and and or you can go to the reading um which is where i mainly update and stuff because i'm i'm basically off social media. Yeah, and that's really one of the three newsletters I read every week, for sure. So, I mean, I also read the writing, so that's why there's a weekly cadence, but it's, it's really, really good. So I highly recommend everyone check it out. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this book to Charlene and Nanya. And this has been very lovely, very fun. Thank you. Uh, any final words, Nanya? No, I was just gonna say thank you for being here. Thank you for your wisdom and for mentoring at large. Um, and uh, whenever your mentoring program is out, um, we'll be sure to sign up. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who attended. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great night.